Welcome to Wall Street versus Main Street, a different take on the investment show with our host, Dax White. Dax White is the managing partner of the White Law Group, a national securities fraud, securities arbitration, and investor protection law firm with offices in Chicago, Illinois, and Vero Beach, Florida. The White Law Group has represented hundreds of investors in FINRA arbitration claims against their brokerage firms, and throughout this show, Mr. White will shine a light on some of the tricks of the brokerage industry, while also providing valuable information for investors on how to successfully navigate the investor-financial advisor relationship. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Wall Street versus Main Street. I'm your host, Dax White. Uh, this is a different take on the investment show. I- I'm not going to be giving you investment advice, buy this, sell that. Uh, I'm not a licensed uh, securities professional. Uh, instead, I'm, I'm an attorney who uh, focuses my practice on representing investors in claims against brokerage firms. And the hope of the show is to pass along some of the information that I've gleaned over the years of doing this that I think would be valuable to investors so that you hopefully end up never needing a lawyer like me. Uh, you know, let, let's, the brokerage industry is sort of set up to try to extract your money and, and there's, a, it, there's a lot of uh, literature actually out there of the transfer of wealth from Main Street to Wall Street as they put together products that pay them more and uh, you know, investment programs that, that are in their best interest as opposed to yours. And so the, the goal of the show is to provide some information so you know what questions to ask to better protect yourself and make sure that you're having a productive relationship with your financial advisor. Because at the end of the day, you know, Wall Street is this like nebulous, huge entity of, of large corporations, but your relationship is with one person. And there's lots of great financial advisors out there, and we want to make sure that you end up with the right ones. Uh, and, and that's usually by having the right information and asking the right questions. Um, and so that, that's the purpose. Uh, This week, we're going to be talking about churning, which is a specific type of investment fraud that we see all too often. Uh, And I think it is important for for investors to have some sense of what it is, what to look out for, how to figure out if you've actually been a victim of it, and then what do you do do if you have. Um, Churning is is basically any time where the financial advisor is trading in your portfolio to maximize commissions at your detriment. Um, and, and there's three basic elements that you would need to prove, uh, in order to establish churning. And I think by going through each of them, that'll sort of give you a sense of what it is. Um, the, the, the first element is control. Um, uh, and in order to, est- to establish control, you, you have to prove, um, who is actually doing the trading because at the end of the day, you as the investor have the ultimate say in how your portfolio is traded. And if you decide for whatever reason that I really want to be aggressive and do some day trading in my portfolio and you've got this financial advisor at some brokerage firm and he agrees to let you do it, uh, but you're really the one making the picks and you're the ones doing the trading, the, 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 the mere fact that the broker might be getting paid a commission for this trading um, is not going to be enough to establish turning if you're the one who has control. If you're the one making the trades, that's element number one. That's the end of the case. Um, and so obviously that that's not an instance if you're the one ultimately making these picks and you lost the money, um, but it was it was your decision making, uh, that's not an instance of churning. Churning is is typically, or is, is always, uh, when the financial advisor has control. But how do, how do you prove that? Because obviously in defending these claims, broker firms are always going to argue that you are the one directing the trades. Um, and, and oftentimes the documentation might even support that because they're going to be sending you confirmations of each trade and a, a bad financial advisor who knows that he's taking advantage of a client but wants to protect himself or herself is going to put on those trades that they were unsolicited, i.e. they were your idea. Um, and so you could get involved in litigation uh, over whether or not the account was churned where the documentation will say that you know 85% of these trades were your idea. Um, and so... That's usually where these things get litigated is trying to prove control. Uh, the easiest way to do it is when the broker actually has discretionary authority over your account. And that's going to be a separate form that you would have signed. The broker says, hey, you know, I know we're doing all these trades. I sometimes can't get you on the phone. It'd be a lot easier if you just gave me digress- discretionary authority so I don't have to get your approval before every transaction. Um and that's going to be a specific form that you're going to sign that says, uh, you know, I give my financial advisors discretionary authority to trade this account. Um, if, 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 if that's what's occurred and you've got a huge volume of trading, controls, that element's going to be very easy to prove. They clearly had control. They had the authority. 
Um, so usually where these cases are litigated is what's called de facto control, which is a pattern of the broker calls, recommends a trade, and you always say yes. I trust you. Whatever you want to do, if you think that's the right thing, that's fine. Um, and if you do that enough times, the broker can establish de facto control uh, because from the perspective of the investor, you would have done whatever they recommended. So if he called and said, you know, I want to buy these 10 stocks, you would have said yes. Um, and so the broker had de facto control over the account. So that, that's the first element. You've got to prove either actual control or de facto control. Because again, if it's, if it's your trading and, and the broker happens to be, have, have, been, excuse me, have been making some money on it, doesn't matter. They were your calls. So it's got to be the broker who's directing the trading. The second element, of course, is that the trading has to be excessive. Uh, you know, we're not talking two or three trades a month or two or three, or you know, even like 15, 20 trades per year. We're talking a huge turnover in the account. Um, and and, and here's, here's where I think the churning element sort of, in terms of the calls that we get where somebody thinks that their account's been churned, here, here's where I think that we sometimes run into problems. Um, you, you also have to look at how your, your broker is being compensated. Uh, because a lot of these portfolios that you see out there now are either 1% or 1.5% of, of the total assets under management, and you don't pay a commission per trade. And so the fact that maybe you're getting a bunch of confirmations in the mail, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, your account's been churned if you're not paying for it. Uh, you could have other problems, but you may not you might not have churning. And then the other thing you see is, is, is these managed accounts where they say, you know, UBS is a big one on managed accounts. They're, they're called, they're like PACE accounts, I think. Um, but in those instances, you, you give it over to a professional money manager, and the, the broker's recommendation was to invest in said money manager. And then you're getting confirmations of all the trading that the money manager is doing. But the compensation of the money manager is, is still usually a percentage of the assets as opposed to commission-based. And so you, you have to be sure, uh, if you think you're being churned, to ask that question, you know, how are you being compensated? Uh, and if it's an assets under management model, then it's probably not churning. Um, churning is when they're being paid per trade. And you start looking at all these various trades. You're getting all these conferences in the mail. And, and you start adding it up going, man, that's a lot of turnover. That's a lot of trades. And suddenly we're talking about some big money. So if, if you fall into that category um, and you know your, your broker is being paid by commission, what you need to look at to determine whether or not it's excessive um, is, is there's a particular rule, it's called the 246 rule, uh, in terms of establishing these claims. A turnover ratio, which is basically, let's say you have a million dollar portfolio, if in a year you've turned that port million dollar portfolio over twice, so you've done two million dollars worth of transactions, two, so that 246, two is suggestive of, of, of excessive trading, four is considered presumptively uh, churning, and then six or more is conclusive. Uh, so basically there's a spectrum there, and depending on where you fall on the spectrum is, more, is sort of how egregious it is. Um, and, and, and there's more that goes into it than that because it also depends on what kind of, what kind of investor you are. If you're a 45-year-old doctor who wants to be a little aggressive and uh, your broker, you know, you guys want to do some trading and, and you turn over your million-dollar portfolio twice, you know, maybe there were some picks you like. I, I, I don't know, but that's not necessarily going to be indicative of excessive trading. Whereas if you're an 85-year-old lady who's, you know, on a fixed income and you're just looking to get some distributions every year, why would there be any kind of significant trading? You would probably be a pretty much buy and hold investor at that point. And so the, the, the range is different there. Um, so the 246 is more of a guideline, but really you got to dig into it and think about in terms of what type of investor you are and where you would fall on the spectrum. The, the second element that you're looking at in, in terms of establishing excessive trading, and, and, and this is sort of the root of it, is determining whether or not the trading is suitable for you. Uh, ultimately, that's the obligation of a financial advisor in every instance, is to make sure that the investment recommendations they're making are suitable for you based on your income, your net worth, your investment objectives, uh, your investment experience, et cetera. And ultimately, when they're making every recommendation, that's what they have to be taking into account. And so in terms of establishing churning, what you're looking at is could this strategy, not necessarily per trade, because you know maybe they can explain away each trade. It's like, oh, well, we bought Apple because they're ready to come out with a new iPhone. We bought this because of that and whatever. So maybe they can explain away every trade. You've, you've got to look at the strategy in general, which is the volume of trading. 
And the broker is going to have to be able to establish that particular strategy was suitable for you. Uh, and, and, and there's a, a nuance in the FINRA rule, which is rule uh, 2111, um, which is it's called quantitative suitability. And that's the one that's really specific to churning where they look at the trading and they, they factor in the commissions that are being generated and they, they, they try to determine whether or not from a just quantitative standpoint, whether or not that volume of trading, regardless of whether or not each pick was right or wrong, if you're moving out of positions that quickly and kicking off this much in commissions, h- how could you possibly argue that the, the recommendations are suitable? And so that's really the best way to determine suitability is, is whether or not, or excuse me, churning, is whether or not the trading is so egregious to the point where they can't justify the strategy. If you've got a million dollar portfolio and they're making 200 grand a year off of you in commissions, they're not going to be able to justify that huge volume of trading because they're not going to be able to outperform the market. They're not going to be able to trade while taking that much off the top uh, and any kind of meaningful strategy that's going to still benefit you. Um, and so, you know, that's where the suitability comes into it. It's got to make sense for you and not for them. Um, and so, you know, that, that's the second element. That's, that's excessive trading and establishing that it's excessive. If, if the commissions are high to a point um, that the strategy they can't justify, then, then the trading is excessive. Uh, the third element is, is scienter, which is sort of like awareness of what they're doing. Uh, and that's a typical, you know, legal element. Um, you know, it, it, you can't just have churning without broker awareness that, that they're taking advantage. Um, but, but similar to control, this, this can be sort of de facto proven. You, you don't need a, a financial advisor who's going to testify in the stand. Yeah, I knew I was screwing the guy. Um, you know, that, that's not typically what you're going to see in terms of litigation. A financial advisor is always going to come in and try to protect themselves. So that they're not going to make that kind of admission. So usually when you're proving it, it's going to be just by similar to proving that it's excessive. It, it's going to be by proving by its very nature, by the amount of commissions that they were making and by the, the, the sheer volume of the trading they were doing, it's pretty clear they knew what they were doing. Um, you know, the cases that, that we've seen, there, there's usually a correlation between the trading and what's going on in their own lives. So that's what we sort of dig into when we're trying to prove a churning claim. Um, you know, the best example that I can think of, I remember years ago, we had a churning case where there was a huge spike in the volume of trading uh, in a particular month. And we were able to determine that the financial advisor was getting married that month. And that was the, the month that he had to pay all the vendors. Um, and so where did he go? He went to our client's portfolio and just started trading like crazy in order to generate enough commission so he could pay all those vendors. Uh, it's not usually that clear cut, um, but, but, but that's, you know, that's what we're looking at in terms of uh, proving that there was scienter. I mean, if there's this obvious correlation between personal expenses and the trading that's going on in your portfolio, that's going to usually be enough to prove that they were aware of what they were doing. Um, the, the next thing that comes into it in terms of turning cases is what are the damages? And there's a there's a couple components there, and and, and you know I think this would be uh, significant to an investor that maybe thinks they've been ripped off. Uh, because maybe you're looking at your portfolio, and let's say you started with the guy in 2013, now it's 2015, and you're up. And you're going, I mean, I think the trading's really high, um, but, you know, sh- should I do anything about it? Because, you know, I started with 200000 now I have 210. Um, so I'm up. Like, I don't think I really have any damages. Um, that's not necessarily true, because if you think about it r- in terms of relative to the market, between 2013 and 2015, the market's up substantially. And so, but for the excessive trading, your portfolio might be at 250 or 260. And so your damages is twofold. Your damages is the commissions that they've been been generating uh, because that has eroded your account relative to where you should be. And then also to look at the performance of the account relative to whatever the appropriate index might be. If you're a you know, moderately aggressive in- investor, maybe you're looking at performance relative to the S&P, um, if you're more conservative, maybe you're looking at, you know, sort of a blended portfolio of the S&P and like the Lehman aggregated bond index. Um, but you're going to be basically looking at how your account performed when you factor in how the commissions would have eroded performance relative to how it should have performed. Um, and again, even though your account might be up, you might still have a claim for damages because maybe your account should be significantly more up. Uh, in a downward moving market, it can be sort of a, a combination of the two. It could be the commissions plus the losses. 
Um, but but even in an upward moving market, if you're if you've got concern that your account's being churned, um, even if your portfolio's up, it's probably worth looking into. It's probably worth talking to a lawyer about. Um, in terms of how these cases are defended by brokerage firms, I mean, I, I sort of touched on it at the beginning. Um, you know, the biggest fight is on control. Uh, you know, the documentation is all put together by the brokerage firms. You're not thinking about it when you're receiving your confirmations because you're not thinking, oh, man, three years from now, I'm going to sue this guy. Um, and so you're not necessarily looking at those confirmations uh, very closely when they come in. But that is how they would defend a case, particularly if the confirms were to say on them unsolicited. Um, you know, that that's the language that they use. A solicited trade is one that's actually recommended by the financial advisor. An unsolicited trade is one that's that's your call. You call and say, hey, I want to buy, you know. I was listening to the news on the way in, and I really want to buy, you know, Apple. Um, they, they would mark that down as solicited, or excuse me, unsolicited. That was your idea. Um, what we've seen in practical experience is that what financial advisors will sometimes do is they will call you with an idea, and you say, yeah, I like it, let's do it, and then they'll put that down as unsolicited, which it shouldn't. That's a, that's a solicited idea. That's their idea. Um, but again, that's where you get into it in terms of litigating these cases is they'll go back, they'll walk you through all the confirms. And if it's a turning case, we're going to be talking hundreds of confirms and they'll say, did you get this in the mail? And you'll, yeah, yeah, I got it. I put it in my file. Um, did you read it? Eh, you know, sometimes I looked at them, sometimes I didn't. Did you see that it was marked unsolicited? No, I didn't notice that. What, did you, do you know that you were supposed, if, if that's not true, that you're supposed to call us? Usually there's some sentence there at the bottom that says, if there's any information on here, not correct, please notify us immediately. And so they'll make this argument that either it was unsolicited or that you should have told them it wasn't. Um, you know, you got this statement, you got to put us on notice and we'll talk to the financial advisor and we'll shut it down. And that's a legal argument called ratification. And so basically they'll try to flip it back on you um, and say, hey, you must have wanted this trading. I mean, you're getting all these confirms. You, you, know, you know there's a lot of trading going on. Like at what point are you going to call us and say, hey, this isn't what I want? Uh, and you can't just wait until till it doesn't work out. Um, so that that's typically what you're going to see. But but again, it focuses on the control and they try to make it seem like you were a conduit or either there was your idea or you're very complicit in the strategy and, and wanted it. Um, but, you know, don't be too concerned about that if, 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 if legitimately you know that either the, the broker had de facto control or discretionary control um, and that you didn't really understand, man, I'm being taken advantage of. And, and frankly, if you're getting a ton of confirmations in the mail and you don't understand why, cause for concern. Time to reach out to somebody. Reach out to a lawyer. Have somebody review it. Um, the, 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 turning, the turnover ratios, uh, you could even talk to your CPA. They should be able to run that for you and, and, and uh, crunch the numbers and find out what the turnover ratio for you is. And if, if the answer has come back that it's higher than six, call a lawyer. Uh, we're going to take a break uh, and uh, we'll be back in a few more minutes. Pools strives to provide quality service with a well-trained staff in the field and in the office. They want you to know that your pool or spa investment means much more to them than just another account. They believe you have entrusted them with your investment and they'll do their best to see that it stays in top condition. Blue Dolphin Pool has been in business over 35 years, setting them apart from the competition. Residential or commercial, Blue Dolphin will keep you in the swim. 567-5853. Why Agua Vida Services? Because you want a safe, sanitary, and energy-efficient pool in your backyard. Rediscover your why and get back in the pool of your dreams. Agua Vida Services is a state-certified pool renovation expert with over 13 years in business in Vero Beach. Let Agua Vida Services help you get in the swim again. Agua Vida Services, water for your life. 7940586, part of the ITIX trading community. Your ITIX dollars are welcome. Hi everyone, it's Kitty from the Blue Star. Hey, have you checked out our new location downtown on 14th Avenue across from the Community Center and Pocahontas Park? You need to. We now have a full kitchen serving our famous chicken pot pie, along with some new favorites like Creole shrimp and grits, seared diver sea scallops, hand-cut Angus ribeyes, and some of the most creative burgers in town. And as always, we have great live music. Join us for our Tuesday night blues jam or perhaps the Thursday jazz series. I'll see you soon at the Blue Star. We're open Tuesday through Saturday from 5 p.m. 
So where are you going to go to watch your favorite football games? JR's American Bar and Grill. They have over 30 TVs and NFL Sunday tickets. JR's with game day specials like sliders, wings, pizza, and of course pitchers of beer, college football games, and free pool too. Get this, happy hour, $2 well drinks till 7 p.m. Oh yeah, two bucks. There's an outdoor patio lounge where smoking is permitted. It's all at JR's. Lunch and dinner seven days a week. 710 US 1 at Oslo Road. JR's American and bar and grill. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Wall Street versus Main Street. I'm your host, Dax White. We've got a few more minutes here, and I'm going to try to be quick because, frankly, some of those uh, drink specials sounded pretty good. Um, but before the break, we were talking about churning, how to identify it, how to determine whether or not you've been a victim of it. Now I want to talk about what a broker standard is to you, because I, I mentioned a little bit in terms of suitability, but I feel like clients are often confused as to what the true standard is, because most investors that I've talked to, and again, we've represented hundreds of investors in claims against brokerage firms, I would say universally that people believe that their broker has a fiduciary duty to them, um, not unlike a lawyer or a CPA, um, where the broker actually has to put their interest, the client's interest, above their own. And unfortunately, the brokerage industry would fight that, and they do in every every case, uh, where they argue that they don't have that obligation to you, that their standard is actually much lower, and really what it is, is is that suitability standard. And all they have to do is make sure that the recommendation is suitable. And, and where, where the, the problem with that, the problem with that distinguish, disting, excuse me, distinction is that there's a big difference between, let's say, client wants to invest in an equities portfolio and what might be suitable for them would be this mutual fund that pays 2% or 4% or this one that pays 1% to the financial advisor. And under a suitability standard, maybe they're similar investments. I'm going to go pick the 4% because that pays me the best. In a fiduciary duty standard, they would have an absolute obligation to recommend the lowest commission one because that's in your best interest, not theirs. And so that's the problem. Uh, and it's something that, frankly, everyone needs to be aware of is that your financial advisor does not necessarily have a fiduciary duty to you, and you should ask them. Uh, and frankly, if they're willing to, you should get them to put it in writing. Yes, I have a fiduciary duty. Um, you know, we, we sort of, in our, in, in our litigation practice, try to paint them in a box at a hearing and get them to admit to it. Uh, and they might shift in their chair and their lawyer will cry and scream. But, but usually it's pretty easy because if you just ask them, um, you know, do you put your cl your interests above your clients? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a lose-lose response there because if they say, yes, I put my own interests first, they look horrible in front of the arbitration panel. And if they say, no, 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 absolutely put my client's interests first, well, now they've just admitted that, they're, that, that they – thought they had a fiduciary duty. But but in terms of the case law that's out there and in terms of the perspective of a brokerage firm, they don't currently claim to have one. Um, and, and you should be aware of that. Um, I will say, though, that it is something that's currently up for new legislation. There are people out there who are trying to uniform the, the, the standard for brokers and to make it a fiduciary duty. Um, and I would absolutely encourage everyone who believes that that would be the appropriate standard to reach out to their congressperson and express interest or express support and ask them uh, to support that legislation because, you know, the reality is that, you know, there's maybe a couple hundred lawyers across the country to do this kind of work, and we're all willing to fight for this, um, but the lobbyists of the brokerage firms are much bigger than we, than we are. Uh, their pockets are deeper, and they're actively fighting this right now to make sure that that standard never goes through because it helps them in litigation. It helps them to justify these trades so that they can just keep saying, nope, all we had was this suitability standard. So be aware of it, and if it outrages you as much as it does me, reach out to your congressperson and say, hey, I'm aware of this litigation or this, this legislation that's being proposed, and I think you should support it. Uh, if you've got any questions for the show, please uh, check out our website, wallstreetvmainstreet.com. Um, you know, I, I do usually have a, a Q and A section, or I, from time to time we will. So, if you have questions, send us one, and I'll try to get to it in a future episode. Next week, we're going to talk about how long you have to file. Let's say you've been ripped off, but you you know you made the investment seven years ago, and you're wondering if there's still time to bring a claim. I'm going to go into that and tell you all about it. You've been listening to Wall Street versus Main Street. 
The views expressed by the participants of the program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the White Law Group, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, nor any of its subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.